and on behalf of my board, it's a pleasure and it's an honor to have Elena. Elena, I cannot pronounce your name, Elena Ancheska. That's very good. Okay. Eager. Eager. Okay, <laughs> from Macedonia. Elena is an associate professor at St. Searle and Methodius University, North Macedonia. Uh, Elena teaches language uh, teacher education courses. Her research interests include mentoring, motivation, professional well being. That's what I'm interested in as well, and teacher agency. So, welcome, Elena. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation and being here with us. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's an honor to be with uh, all of you. And um, I'm looking forward to um, getting in discussion about some of the issues that um, my talk will potentially trigger. Um, also, it's a bit intimidating to talk about Freire in front of uh, a Brazilian audience <laughs> because um, I, I'm, I'm, I have to say I'm very envious of all of you being able to um, you know, um, engage with, with his work without the medium of translation. I'm not saying that the translation, that, that the, the book that I, um, that I have next to me is not a good translation, but it's still translation nonetheless. So, uh, if ever I learn, I end up learning Brazilian, it's going to be so as I can, so that I can read him in the original. Um, I'll start sharing my screen. Um, is that all right? Can you all see my slides? Yeah, excellent. Yes. Um, so yeah, I'll be talking about um, some of the work I did that was very uh, heavily inspired by uh, by Paulo Freire's work. Um, uh, as the title suggests, um, I decided to experiment with a little bit of self-organized learning. I decided to engage my learners, in, my um, students in self-organized learning. Um, in an online context, this is mostly due to, uh, the online context is due to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so with the shift to um, online learning, um, I decided that the, the group, I noticed that the group dynamics in my uh, teacher education um, sessions changed slightly. Uh, so I uh, decided and, to... And, sorry, can I interrupt you for one second? Sorry to interrupt. Um, sorry. It's not showing the full screen, your slides. Can you? Mm -hmm. What exactly are you seeing? Uh, um, not seeing. One of the, yes, the sequence of slides, right? The presenter presentation view, you're seeing like the one that shows like the next slide that's coming. Mm -hmm. uh, Elena, so this I, is Tyson. Sure, oh. Tyson, hi. Hi. Um, Go up to slideshow. Yeah. And then click. Now at the top, you'll see use slideshow. Yeah. Click that. Ah, oh, thank you. There we go. Okay. Is that better? Great. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Tyson. <laughs> and sorry about that. Um, yeah, so um, back to self-organized learning in, in, the, in my teacher education room. Um, so as you can see, I, I work with um, pre-service teachers. I support them, um, I support teacher learning in them. And um, how, however, the, um, some of the um, messages, uh, some of the points in, in this presentation, I'm, in this talk, I'm sure will be very easily transferable to any kind of learning um, setting, not necessarily teacher education, um, general um, English context, um, English for academic purposes context, etc. Any kind of learning, not, not necessarily English language learning um, either. Um, so by self-organized learning, uh, what I mean by this is um, I decided to uh, minimize my presence in order to maximize my students' involvement uh, because I feared that, um, that there was a slight um, change in, involve in, in, in how they engaged, the extent to which, to, to which the students engaged, etc., due to the shift to online. Um, <clears throat> I decided to, to um, design um, this talk as an account of a journey. 
uh, my journey started with the puzzle. The, the puzzle was actually the, the um, perceived lack of engagement on the part of my students. Um, how do I engage them more uh, was the guiding question. I then decided to uh, consult some of, some of the relevant literature. Freire obviously features uh, dominantly there um, in order to kind of um, help me design a more informed approach to, to tackle my puzzle. Um, then I will discuss uh, some of my students' um, le self-organized learning experiences and my own as an observer to, to their learning. And finally, I'll um, round off with reflections and implications uh, with a focus on uh, implications to um, other contexts. What, does, what, what do some of the lessons that I learned um, uh, imply for other contexts? Um, the, the first step um, on this, the, the first place on my itinerary was the puzzle. It wasn't as dark uh, as this really. Uh, this is a little bit, you know, the, the choice of photography is for dramatic effects. But um, it, it was uh, a situation that increasingly concerned me. Um, even before the pandemic, before we switched uh, to online, uh, to the online medium, I noticed that uh, not all of my students uh, engaged as much um, in our um, sessions, as much as I would like to, to, to have seen them engage. Uh, so I work with small group groups of students, 10, 15, um, but we, um, I, I help them develop reflective practice and that's very difficult to, um, to achieve without their active involvement. So without them experiencing reflection, it's difficult to uh, prompt it in, in writing, etc. further on in the, uh, on, on the course. So here's the context. Um, I try to help them uh, become reflective practitioners, uh, which relies on their active involvement. Um, so I would say that half of the group, uh, if I was lucky, would actively uh, engage during our sessions. And I have to say that our sessions are quite short, 45 minutes. So, you know, it's easy not to not, not to actively get in, uh, engaged because, you know, you might not get uh, you might you, you, you might not. Um, uh, get a turn during the 45 minutes, but um, I noticed that, you know, some students uh, tended to be off the radar and not necessarily um, engaging as much as I would have liked to see them. Um, the, the situation was exacerbated by the online medium of instruction. Um, so, um, Many of uh, some of the students were threatened by the awkward silences due to the, you know, to the turn taking lag in, in um, online environments. Some students' cameras had to be off sometimes for um, due to logistical, uh, logistical reasons, sometimes because the students chose to do so. Um, some students were unresponsive even when I called on them. So they were there, but they, they weren't actually there. Um, so the the interaction, the group dynamics was um, had changed due to the um, online environment, and um, I felt that as a group we started struggling, struggling to communicate, struggling to effectively communicate in order to support their learning. Um, what I put on the left side of the slide is narration sickness, prayer stem, um, leading to dehumanization. And uh, obviously, my sessions are very interactive. Um, we try to engage, to share um, reflections from observed classes, etc. So uh, it, it's not really a lecture style um, course anyway. Um, however, if you um, if you as a as a moderator as an instructor um, see only several you know the same several people engaged in every session, then the rest of the group actually starts listening to the dominant narratives and not necessarily um, engage themselves. So that's the kind of narration sickness that that I started to suspect and got concerned about, um, which. Um, puts uh, those people the, those students who who end up passively listening throughout the course um, in a kind of oppressed um, situation, dehumanized situation. So I wanted to help everyone um, engage as much as possible in order to, to be able to develop their reflective practice. Um, <clears throat> 
the alternative to the darkness was um, this kind of brightness, the kind of brightness that I uh, sought um, to, to get inspired by, by consulting the literature. Um, and the first point of reference was um, educational philosophy, uh, to be more precise, Freire. And um, I, I, I was, uh, I've always been inspired by his um, insistence that knowledge emerges only through invention and uh, reinvention, through the restless, impatient, as he says, continuing hopeful inquiry um, that human beings pursue in the world with the world and with, with each other. There's the collaborative element that, that, that um, my context really was um, very attuned for. We, the, the idea was to help each other uh, develop our reflective skills. Um, and uh, his insistence on uh, teacher students, as he calls them, and student teachers, that is the, the teacher and the student uh, becoming more than just teachers and just students. So as he says in his own words, the teacher is no longer the one who teaches, but the one who is himself or himself or herself taught in dialogue with the students who in turn, while being taught, also teach. They become jointly responsible for a process in which all grow. So I wanted to see um, more of my students teaching me as well as um, creating time for, my, for myself to learn alongside them um, with, but also from them. So in this context, students become critical co-investigators in, in dialogue with the, uh, with the teacher. I also decided to consult um, other literature, so not only educational philosophy, I wanted to um, look at um, other fields as well. Um, educational psychology is another thing that I'm really um, passionate about. Um, and I'll, look, uh, I'll discuss the um, um, right column first before going back to uh, the, the left, um, the, the text in the, on the left hand side. Um, so two theories that um, kind of gave me confidence to um, experiment a little bit with self-organized learning in my context. The first one is self-determination theory by Ryan and Desi, who argue that all motivated behavior relies on three pillars. The first one is competence. So uh, motivated pe people um, have opportunities to, to experience success, to feel com competent in whatever they're doing. If we're talking about, we can talk about learners, we can talk about professional contexts. So we have to, uh, as educators, uh, help our students feel successful. Um, another thing that we need to provide for them is freedom, to, to feel that they have um, some autonomy in how they operate. And finally, um, uh, the, the third pre prerequisite is relatedness. Uh, we need to provide us a web of um, uh, relationships that is supportive to, to um, supportive to learning. If three, these three prerequisites are there, competence, autonomy, and relatedness, uh, the chances for learnersy to develop are, are bigger. By learnersy, I, I really like this uh, this coin by Claxton, two thousand and four. Um, I'm guessing he's he was inspired by. Um, numeracy, literacy, etc. Learnacy is a similar skill, but it, it, it's, it's the skill to, to learn on your own without necessarily depending on a mentor, a teacher, someone else who is to guide you through the learning process. So hopefully, if students are um, feel competent, feel competent, uh, autonomous, and connected enough, the chances for them to um, feel that they can take charge of their own learning. Um, on their own terms, that is develop learners here higher. Um, another um, theory from uh, educational uh, psychology is PERMA. Um, this is essentially um, positive psychology. According to Seligman, um, happiness in general um, relies on um, the, the following um, five pillars, according to him positive emotions, so happy people experience enough positive emotions. This is not to say that negative emotions are to be thrown out, out of the window. Obviously, they have important uh, functions to, to, um, to offer in, in the process of developing happiness, but th there needs to be enough of positivity in people's life for them to be happy. Um, 
happy people experience engagement uh, often, so they feel that they're immersed in what they what they do. They they feel happy to you know that they, they feel uh, that they can you know this kind of sense of flow when time stops for you and you are the task. You're so immersed in the task. Um, uh, is, Feelings like this are, are important uh, to, to experience. Obviously, it's unrealistic to expect them to happen all of the time, but uh, you know, um, our learning environments need to, to um, provide enough of opportunities for us to experience this. Relationships, again, another link to uh, Ryan and Desi above. Um, we need to have the support of um, positive relationships in order to feel happy. We need to be able to take meaning out of what we do. So what we do um, needs to be fulfilling for us so that we can um, feel competent, accomplished in what we do. Uh, as you can see, there are uh, there is a degree of overlap between self-determination and PERMA. Um, and the essence to me is that, um, you know, Involved, motivated behavior relies on involvement, in uh, essentially involvement with the task in order to feel immersed in it and uh, involvement uh, with that is connectedness with the people around us. Um, so with this in mind, um, Mm, I also I'm also going to briefly discuss a very interesting project that just uh, that, that is still taking place at uh, my institution at my university. Something that uh, myself and a few colleagues started. Uh, the, the dean was very happy to support this, especially um, as um, we initiated this uh, uh, in the midst of uh, the COVID-19 crisis. So we uh, polled uh, our colleagues and uh, the students with regard to how they were fed during the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Um, and uh, surprisingly many, both students and staff, uh, suggested that they needed some kind of psychosocial uh, support, some kind of psychological um, support uh, to help them feel focused, motivated, engaged throughout, uh, throughout the crisis. So we decided to, to work with a psychologist to, to help us, um, to, to help provide this support. Um, we initially envisaged this project as a psychologist offering sessions to people who might need uh, psychological counseling, but the psychologist was adamant that what we needed more than this was actually um, her helping us all, the staff and via the staff, um, the, student, the students, she felt that all of us needed uh, to feel that we can help ourselves first before seeking external psychological expert advice. Um, so uh, we decided to work as uh, a small group of 15, 20 uh, teachers to start with, um, with the psychologist in order to develop self-care skills um, as well as uh, skills to um, support uh, our students' uh, men, uh, mental uh, well-being as well. Um, so we worked on uh, ourselves because, again, you need to feel that you're in a good place in order to be able to help um, uh, your students. Um, and via our work, via what we do in the classrooms, help try, try and, and, and help our students. Um, the, one of the things that we did together as a, as a, a group of teachers was to experiment with um, giving, uh, entrusting our students with um, holding virtually teacherless uh, lessons. So um, minimizing our presence in order to maximize uh, their involvement in the class, uh, giving them charge of their own learning. Um, in order to tap into the feelings of competence, back to Ryan and Desi, um, relatedness, autonomy, very much so, because we gave them free reign in terms of how they conducted the sessions. Obviously, this happened at the end of the semester, so they were kind of used to how we held sessions. They had an idea about um, expectations, our expectations. Um, this feeds into engagement. The chances were that they might be more engaged if uh, they're given the uh, the the rain, you know, the, the um, ownership of the whole thing. Um, 
and the chances were that this was going to be a meaningful um, experience for them because they were going to try and craft something themselves without necessarily our direct help, uh, leading to hopefully leading to accomplishment. Um, also, uh, the literature on general education uh, provided support for our thinking. Um, think about Mitra's, Sugata Mitra's uh, experiment in self-organized learning. There's a wonderful TED talk uh, and the full reference to this is at, at, at the end of the slide. So I warmly recommend that you have a look if you haven't already. Um, he um, decided to expose uh, children living in Indian slums to uh, the internet. Uh, he just left a computer there, no teacher, nothing, a, a, a completely teacherless environment, and invited them to um, teach themselves, which they did very quickly. Um, and, uh, you know, learning the English language is a byproduct of teaching themselves uh, how to use the internet. Uh, the teacher figure in this context was, um, he calls them grannies, uh, teachers who only provide um, effective support without necessarily having the skills to cognitively guide, guide them through the exper experience. Um, so he wrote lots of, uh, on self-organized learning and how it's possible with uh, children, you know, even with preschoolers, let alone with university students, as was in my case. And uh, another bit of uh, support from the literature is uh, learn autonomy. Um, the, the idea that uh, we, we do want to give students choice with uh, regarding um, what they do on the course, um, how they do things, the methodologies part is underlined because I decided to, to experiment exactly with this and I'll show you how in a second. Um, involving them in, in their own assessment. Lenny Dam is wonderful for um, for examples of student driven assessment. Um, she, she's done a lot of uh, self-assessment with her learners and um, her claim is that uh, the, the more we involve them in assessing themselves, the more they assess themselves really well, even better than the teacher eventually. This is what she found from her own experience. But also um, beyond Holek, there is also um, the case that we can involve our learners in um, wider, broader issues, um, you know, beyond the classroom, such as curriculum design and our own research projects, involving them as our research assistants, for instance. Um, and uh, this is the, mm, the, the, the following place, shall I say, say on, the, uh, on the itinerary, um, the student self-organized learning experiences. This is what we did actually uh, with the students using the theoretical frameworks that I uh, just referred to. So depending on the group dynamics, because I work with mm, many different uh, small groups of pre-service teachers, um, depending on how well I knew them, how, uh, how mm, well bonded they were within, the, with the, within their own groups, um, I decided to uh, invite them to um, hold their own uh, online sessions uh, with me either observing them uh, just as an observer, not necessarily participating. Um, also participating as a learner, uh, so behaving as if I were a student in the classroom, or not not, even, not, not being pre present at all in the virtual uh, in the virtual room. Uh, this, um, I would say, strongest form of self-organized learning, um, I offered to the groups that I felt. Um, we're up to the challenge, you know, well bonded, don't look like they need me much, etc. Um, and obviously, some of the groups that I offer this challenge to, challenge C to, um, decided to opt out, suggesting that this was a bit too radical, and we, just, we negotiated uh, weaker forms of their involvement, such as me observing or me participating as a learner, etc., minimizing my presence in order to um to to see them engage more and then we reflected on what happened um my observations um uh with regard to what happened um interestingly since the sessions were um held online on zoom um we had the luxury to record them so they record the sessions and um send them to me. These, these are the sessions that I didn't actually attend as such. 
Um, so I could review them at, in my own time and provide uh, any feedback on the platforms uh, that we used or next time we met on Zoom. Uh, what I found was that uh, my pre-service teachers, the student teachers, were visibly more talkative. So uh, more than half uh, took part in the conversations. Uh, many of them laughed, which I didn't hear often, uh, which I do, don't hear often in sessions, you know, loud laughter, for instance, wonderful to observe. Mm, but I didn't get as much in face to face sessions. Um, they use colloquialism, sometimes even their local dialects. Um, sometimes they switch from English to their own um, local Macedonian dialects. Again, very interesting to see. Doesn't happen, maybe perhaps because of its informality, doesn't happen in the regular teacher education room. Their body language was a lot more relaxed. Um, most of the students took part in discussions, even the shyest ones. Even the silences that occurred, you know, naturally due to the online context, it takes time for people to take turns um, uh, online. Even those silences were not as awkward as uh, um, perhaps, they, they, you know, it, that, that's what it looked like to, to me as an observer. Um, my guess is because, uh, again, most of them hang out in their free time, their friends themselves, and um, even any silences that occurred um, were really, you know, just a natural part of the uh, conversation, nothing, nothing awkward to observe. Um, the task uh, was done very, I was surprised by the quality of, of the work that they did. Um, I usually have lots to say on, on their work. This time I found that I only had a few additional points to make. Um, it's interesting that they used up most of the time for the 45 minutes that were allotted for this task, um, which end up being a lot fewer if I get involved because I, you know, sometimes I, I can sometimes get carried away in monologues and leave less time for them to, to express themselves. Um, so I had very few additional points to, to add to their work, which was amazing. Um, and interestingly, they, they, uh, they had the chance to have a first-hand experience of uh, sometimes long silences where they, they weren't sure where to go, what to say, etc. and blank screens. Sometimes they were really struggling to engage some of their colleagues. They didn't even know that they were actually uh, present in the virtual room. And I felt that that was potentially an opportunity for them to develop empathy for us <laughs> instructors or potentially solidarity with us, you know, understanding um, how it may feel to a person who is trying to moderate um, the discussion might develop solidarity in them for our own uh, teacher education sessions. Um, I, I then asked them about how, how the whole experience went for them, and um, they were unanimous that it was a, a pleasant experience. They, they were really interested in further exploring it. Uh, some of them were concerned about their informal exchanges in an academic context, uh, perhaps in the context of potentially sharing them with me, you know, all their uh, informalities, colloquialisms, etc. However, I never um, insisted on any formality in the course. Anyway, and was I, I was amazed to 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 observe such exchanges. So that was not a problem for me at all. Um, and others were concerned about the absence of um, formal moderation. So some of them, um, let me just show you some of the quotes. Um, one person said, honestly, I would say that your absence as a moderator was really felt. Um, another person um, uh, seconded this, uh, that they, they seem to have, uh, that they seem to miss a person formally doing the moderation for them. But on the other hand, as, as an observer to their exchanges, I felt that uh, the students were so um, organic uh, about the whole thing and that the moderation role was filled anyway by someone. Sometimes it was one person leading the whole group through the discussion. Sometimes it was shared. I felt that uh, they didn't really miss me at all as a, as a moderator, that they were really capable of uh, guiding the discussion themselves as a group. Uh, so I feel that this final concern might be potentially misplaced. Uh, 
because what I observed was uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, and then we come to the so what. Um, how does this relate to other contexts? Um, what are the implications for other learning situations? Um, I think the implications are many. Um, one of the things that I found out with this short experiment, this was just one semester, I experimented uh, with uh, self-organized organized learning in my students for just, just one semester. And I felt that um, self-organization doesn't necessarily require any special provisions. In my context, mm, it, just, it, it sufficed for me to disappear from the um, teacher education room so that they can get involved, engaged, empowered. Um, it, it was obvious that they felt uh, that they achieved um, the, the, the aims of the, of the sessions because they, they provided each other, they, they provided feedback for each other. We usually discuss um, other people's uh, sessions, lessons. And so they felt that they were really successful in helping their peers uh, revise the, the lessons that it just held. So the, the um, element of um, you know, competence, the opportunity to experience success was very much there. It was very tangible. I could, I, I could feel it in, in what I observed. And they were actually, uh, they were also verbalized it saying, I think we were, some, some of them, for instance, said, I believe that the suggestions we had were rather useful for our peers, which I agreed with. It wasn't just you know, them trying to be nice. It was actually them trying to, um, to come up with really uh, good arguments for, for what they were proposing and for very interesting alternatives. Uh, you know, how things could be done differently, for instance, which is very helpful for that piece. Um, the, the concept of self-organization is very, very easily adjustable to various educational contexts. Um, we can discuss English language teaching, we can discuss um, math teaching, physics teaching, really, uh, you could, uh, the, the, the underlying principles, uh, giving the students the tool to succeed and leaving them to succeed on their own, so that you can all reflect uh, together about what you observed um, is something that uh, can be done in any educational environment, I feel. And not only educational environment, we can think about professional environments too. Um, I found that my students, and not only my students, I'm talking also on behalf of the, of the other um, um, colleagues that took part in the project, 15-ish teachers eventually uh, conducted experiments like this, and all of us had very similar Mm, reflections to exchange. The students were generally able, very, very, very much able uh, and willing to, to engage in various formats of self-organization. Again, it's very important that we um, adjust the level of challenge to the um, group, you know, to the group, uh, to the to group in terms of um, their maturity, how capable they are of dealing with the challenge, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there are ways in which we can adjust the, the level of challenge. Um, the gains are many mm, for cognition. For my students, for instance, the, the ones that I observed were mm, very capable of uh, doing the tasks very well, perhaps even better due to the um, much more relaxed uh, learning environment than with me in the teacher education room. Um, they were obviously a lot more engaged and motivated. Uh, the group dynamics was completely different and potentially this was con conducive to the cognitive and motivational gains. And I could see them um, seeing value in, uh, in, in this whole thing, uh, witnessing that they're capable of, of uh, doing the teacher's job, doing the task themselves um, and doing them well. I suppose gave them a feeling of um, accomplishment, of, uh, of meaning to what they did. And I'm, I'm hoping that some of them were really engaged, perhaps not to the, to the extent of achieving flow, but um, to the extent of taking part. And most of the students took part in, in, in these sessions. Um, in terms of implications, in terms of reflecting about other con contexts, these are some of the uh, questions that might prompt you to, to uh, consider self-organized learning in your own context. Um, perhaps it's worthwhile thinking about how you can offer uh, these kind of opportunities uh, to your students. Think about, for instance, 
the choice you can um, offer to your students with regard to course aims. If these are fixed, you know, if you have a fixed syllabus to follow, uh, then potentially uh, thinking about uh, which course aims you do first and which later, etc., might give students a little bit of um, agency in the whole process. Um, they can be given choice in terms of content, you know, how do we achieve the syllabus goals? Do we have to achieve them by following the textbook um, content necessarily, or can we swap some of that content for content that's more relevant, meaningful, enjoyable, etc., to you, to the students? Um, I just illustrated how I tweaked the method methodologies. So I um, gave them, gave my students complete freedom with regard to how they held our online sessions. Obviously, they had the uh, the the model in my sessions in how I hold my sessions, but they were really um, given free reign with regard to how they would like to to hold theirs. And this might be an interesting diagnostic tool. So it might be interesting to start. Um, a course, perhaps not the very first lesson, but uh, early on, uh, get the students to hold a session for you so that you can implicitly kind of elicit um, their ideas about uh, good methodologies or the methodologies they would expect to, um, uh, to see used on the course. Uh, perhaps you can involve them in, in assessment, in curriculum design, in your own research project. There are many avenues to, to consider. This is just some. And uh, if some of you are interested in uh, continuing this discussion, I appreciate uh, this slot is quite limited. Um, I started a little Padlet. I'm going to share the link in a second in the chat, chat box. Um, and I shared some of these uh, examples with you there. It will be wonderful if people join and um, contribute uh, more ideas or perhaps comment on existing ideas. Um, I'm conscious of time uh, and I would like to thank you for the time being. This is my contact. I would, I would love to hear from you if you're interested in any, um, in, in any um, explorations of, of this sort or not only. Um, these are the references. I'm very happy to share the slides so that you can um, explore them in more detail. Um, and I think hey, I'll... Um, Elena, yeah. there are two questions for you. Sure, sure, um, sure there on the chat. Yes, if you could answer Rose, there is a question from Rose and one from Tyson. Mm -hmm. Excellent, I'll, I'll be there in a second. This is the link to the Padlet if, if you're interested to join us there. And I'm just scrolling through things. Um, mm -hmm. Rose, did you apply this self-organization model predominantly to input sessions or also to online teaching practice and feedback sessions too? Also really interested in how you scaffolded this across the course. Um, thank you, Rose. Um, very interesting questions. So um, in my context, we, uh, with my students, we observe uh, their sessions and uh, discuss each other's observations um, together with them. So we usually use a, a model. It's called um, Systematic Informed Reflective Practice. I like to use this acronym uh, for, for the model. It's by Malderes. Uh, 2015. Uh, so there are five steps that we um, usually use to, to discuss what we've observed. Uh, so the students um, by, you know, as, as the course progresses, the students increasingly get used to the structure. So the structure is there. Again, they didn't need to use the structure, but they have the, the, the support of the structure in case they uh, wanted to go, go to it. Um, so it wasn't really input sessions that uh, that I'm discussing. Um, these are sessions that they were used to um, taking part in. Uh, although the the problem was that not everyone was uh, as involved as in the self-organized sessions. Um, However, I think there is scope to consider um, potentially using uh, self-organization in input sessions as well. Um, for instance, um, assigning um, a, um, a reading task, some kind of text to the students and uh, giving them some guidelines, getting them to um, explore the, the text together um, in small groups and uh, then feeding back in the, uh, to the class might be another idea. The flipped classroom would be another, obviously, 
uh, another approach to to this um, you know to this way of self organization um, and uh, to just tackle the second part of your question how do you, how did you scaffold this across the course um, I actually use this uh, I, I started experimenting with this towards the end of the semester so I didn't really um, have much experience with this uh, the the Mm, the good news was that I was able to try this with multiple groups at the same time and get different kinds of uh, feedback from different groups. Um, it, it would be interesting to mm, think about how this can be introduced earlier on. And I mentioned uh, in as part of my talk that it can be used as a diagnostic tool, you know, getting them to uh, uh, teach you a lesson in my context because that's relevant for my students might give me an insight into their apprenticeship of observation, what they bring to the uh, to the teacher education setting. Um, so that's one way that I could potentially use this uh, to start with and then potentially uh, develop as the course uh, progresses. And I'm just looking at Tyson's question. Mm -hmm. Uh, when necessity exists, roles shift and emerge naturally, even seemingly awkward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that one or more students felt your absence. Uh, did this ever backfire on the student, students' expe expectations of what your role was? Um, uh, what I found was that perhaps, mm, mm, actually, I couldn't see uh, them missing them missing me much in the in the teacher education room because uh, what I observed convinced me that they were so confidently uh, grappling with all the challenges um, they might have missed the usual so then they, they might have uh, they might have been struck by the novelty of the whole experience I appreciate that um, but I wouldn't say that the quality of what they did was uh, in any way influenced by my absence. And even uh, even so, e even if I was not there, they knew that I was gonna uh, that I was gonna be reviewing their work and providing feedback and adding my notes to what they did, etc. Um, so I I like to and this is subject to uh, this is something that I need to investigate further on um, as I experiment with this approach. But um, I like to think that uh, it was the the effect of novelty that uh, you know that that, that uh, got them thinking about the whole thing rather than them missing me much. <laughs> and even even if it, you know. Uh, I, I think that, you know, it, it's not very good news if students get so attached to us because they shouldn't. We're, we're here to advise them. We're always here. They can always email us, you know, even beyond the, the teacher education uh, context. Um, to develop learners, see, they really need to, to slowly let go. And especially if they have the skills. And um, I know that they do because they showed me that they had had the skills to to um, do a session uh, without me, as well, if not better than with me. Hmm. Um, uh, Eliana, would you mind sharing your contact, your email here in the chat box? Sure, sure, sure. sure. Thank you sure. very much. Um, That's great. That's great, Elena. Thank you. Yeah, it's the yeah. Sorry, I'm just going through the notes. Yeah, it's the attachment thing. I I think that, you know, and Freire also talks about this paternalistic um, aspect of teaching. You know, as much as it's, and as much as it can um, be helpful, reassuring for the students, it, there are hidden dangers in it, and I think that. Um, you know, they, they benefit, that they might benefit from being left on their own and potentially struggling to, to find their way out, uh, more so than staying attached to us necessarily, especially as they know that we're here anyway. We are, we are watching them <laughs> with a, in, in this case, 
with a delay, but still they knew that I was gonna uh, go back to the experience and, and uh, as always uh, share my views on, on their work. I'm, I'm really interested to, to hear whether any of this resonates with uh, the rest of you, especially uh, it will be really interesting to, to hear from uh, teachers potentially teaching in different contexts, um, general English, English for academic purposes, um, any other English for specific purposes, um, any contexts uh, other than necessarily teacher education, though I hope that I was clear about how things can be easily transferable across contexts. Yes, you were. Yes, thank you very much, Eli. And any other questions, anyone? Would anyone like to share anything, any comments? But Elena, it was, it was really wonderful to start our second day of Web Carnival with you. Um, thank you very much for your presence, for sharing your, your experience, your knowledge with us. And uh, yes, hope to see you around many times, right? Uh, thank so you, I'll definitely thank you. stay around. Not sure whether yeah. I'll be able to stay with my camera on because I have a toddler and it's very loud here, but I'll definitely be <laughs> dropping okay. on the sessions that follow. Thank you very, very much indeed. And have a nice day then. Thank you all. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Let's all. continue our web carnival. There are two tents. Yes, remind. Uh, can uh, Tyson or someone just share the program once again so people can see the two options? The two tents. Okay, thank you, Elena. Thank you.